Hi, I'm Brian. I'm Derica, and you're watching CS Brews. And this is a special thing that we're trying out called Brew Talk. Where we answer some viewer questions and comments and talk about a common theme among those questions. Today's theme is racking, which we get tons of questions on this, and there's lots of misnomers, and we're going to try to clear that up today. I narrowed this down from 50 pages to one page and two lines. <laughs> Because a lot of people were asking the same questions over and over again. Let's start with the first comment slash question. We may answer some of these as we go, and then we're going to talk a little bit about it at the end. Jason the Hammer said, Woohoo! I am a new fan. A friend and I did two batches of Viking's Blood Mead. Now we use D47. We will degas and rack to a secondary after two weeks. Right there, that sounds like a great comment and everything's awesome, except where did he get the two weeks from? I always keep saying, I tell people this all the time, don't go by a certain amount of time, especially when it comes to mead. Honey takes longer to ferment. So like for beer, people think, oh, three to five days. Well, sometimes it could be longer. It could be shorter. Um, wines can be a week to two weeks. Ciders, a week to two weeks. Meads can be three to four weeks. But that's approximates. Never ever go by that Yeah, it's a generalization and there are so many factors and we're going to go through as many factors as we can. Yeah, I mean everything episode. from the type of yeast used to how much sugars to what you put in it to temperature, extra, temperature, extra additives. Yeah. There's so many things that will affect how long it takes your brew to finish that just saying two weeks really isn't a good way to go. Now I know a lot of recipes, a lot of older recipes say wait two weeks then rack. Don't do that. Don't Just don't blanket go by that. Take readings. We'll get to that in a minute. Perfect Apex said, So after primary fermentation, and I've degassed initially, and racked or racked and degassed rather, and now it's just going through clearing and off-gassing, do I need to keep it in a warm area or can I leave it in my garage? I want to answer that first. You do not need to leave it in a warm area ever. That's really not a, a recommendation. Um, you can keep it someplace room temperature or cooler for any brew. Now, I'm going to put a little caveat on that. Depending on where you live, warm is a relative Right, but comment. he's saying keep it in a warm place. You don't want to put it intentionally in some place warm, any brew, at any time. You never want to do that, whether it's primary fermentation, secondary, aging in bottles, storing of bottles. You never want to keep it in a warm place, okay? Keep it as cool as you can without refrigeration, obviously. I mean, Sure, if but your if house... you're in Scandinavia and your garage stays at... That's not cool. That's cold. There's a difference. I'm saying cool. That's why I said it was relative. And so if I have to put numbers to it, <laughs> probably below 50 degrees is not so good. Probably above 80 degrees Fahrenheit. That is, is probably not so good. Anything in between, probably pretty good. Now let me finish this comment. Not necessarily cold crashing. I would do that after my final racking, but just when I'm giving it time to clear and I just have it in a carboy with an airlock degassing, do I need to keep it in a warm place or does temperature matter? We just talked about that. I just don't want my house to smell over the weeks while it degasses. I've never experienced this. Some people have said that they get like sulfurous compound smells and rotten egg smells, which is sulfurous compound smells. We live in we really a don't. relatively small house. Yeah. And because we've upped our production to a new brew every week. I have like 20 things fermenting right now. We have large fermenters right over there. We, we have never smell it. Brian's desk house. is completely, there's no foot room anymore now down there. And we don't yeah. smell it. And then, and how long do I let it secondary ferment and clear? Well, that, totally up to you. I mean, some, we go like a month. Sometimes we go a year. I like to play with that. And... The longer you let it go, in general, the better it's going to be. That's the easiest way to go. After about a year, you'll start to see very little result for the amount of time. Like, you'll have to go a lot longer time to see any difference. But, like, three months is good. Six months is good. A year is good. Those three breakdowns are pretty general. The only time that we've seen a difference yeah. in that was with our fruit-based mellow mouths. So we're not talking about the citrus ones or the apple ones because they give them all the time that they can take. Um, but some of our fruit-based ones were awesome right when they were done and then they mellowed too much. So yeah, the, some of the them fruitiness yeah, got true. lost. The so sweet red wine is another one. When you take your initial taste, if you are completely in love with that beverage at the initial taste, Bottle it. drink it. Yeah, bottle it and drink it. Um, he also says, I know autolysis is a thing, and I'm wondering how long I can go before I filter out everything in bottle. What he's talking about is leaving your brew on the lease. How long can you do that? This is another one that it depends on what you're making. And that's where a lot of these rumors and myths come from is 
beer brewers, you don't want to leave it on the lease too long because it has a lower alcohol content and it does absorb flavors much more quickly. Whereas meads and wines can sit on the lease a lot longer before they in inherit any extra flavors. But a generality in beer, it's months. I mean, months, like six, seven months before anything noticeable starts to come. Somebody's going to tell me that that's not true and it depends on the beer. If you make a really low alcohol beer, it could be shorter time. If you make a higher alcohol beer, it's less time. It sounds counterintuitive, but that's how it works. So when you get to the meads and wines, it could be nine months to a year before anything is noticeable. So that's when I hear about people like, oh, I had to get it off the lease after two weeks. Why? There was no point in doing that if it wasn't done yet. And we'll get to that in a minute. Himath Kumar, dear Brian and Derek. I like it when people address us like Hi. that. It makes it feel like, you know, we're friends or yeah. something. Um, I made a bunch of grape wine. The bubbles have stopped, so I have come to the conclusion that the fermentation process has stopped. However, the grape skins are still floating over the top. Should I rack it now, or should I wait until the skins sink to the bottom? Thank you. Now, here's the thing. That stuff may never actually sink. So waiting isn't really going to benefit you. And just because the bubbles have stopped doesn't mean it's actually done, or it doesn't mean that it just finished. Uh, generally speaking, what you want to do is... Wait a few weeks with any brew. And I'm saying a few weeks. It could be anywhere from 3 to 20. <laughs> <laughs> then take a gravity reading. Before you rack it, take a gravity reading. A lot of people are saying, I racked it, then took a gravity reading. You're doing that backwards. Take the gravity reading. Wait one week. Put it back under airlock. I'll seal it all up. Wait one week or two or three or four. However long you want to is fine. But at least a week is a good range. If those two numbers have not changed... It's done. And what, now you can put it in. So after that one week time, take another grab oh, gravity yeah, yeah. reading and compare those two readings. Sorry. I guess I didn't say that. It's okay. <laughs> so that's the trick is you want to know that the gravity is consistent and it's done. And it should be in the lower range. If your gravity is 1090 after all this, it's probably stuck, not done. There's a dist distinct difference unless you made something that should be 1090 at the end, which that's a whole other video. Don't do that. Anyway. Psy, one month in primary fermentation. How long in secondary before you bottled it? Two weeks? So six weeks before bottling? Again, no specific time. My brew will work differently than your brew. Even if you follow my exact recipe, even if you live next door to me and we have the same kind of situation, they can work differently. There's a, a general range, but they will work differently. It's best to have those measurements rather than say, oh, well, after two weeks, I'm going to rack. And the basis for all of this is that yeast is a living organism. Yep. And as we know with other living organisms, such as people, we don't do things the exact same way, so the yeasts aren't either. Yeah, and if you do things like I do, I really feel sorry. <laughs> Ryan Bishop. Okay, so I am going to do a five-gallon batch of this. After three weeks of fermentation in the five-gallon carboy, do I have to rack it and let it set for a second fermentation and so on? Basically, what I'm asking is if what I was to bottle it from the five-gallon carboy. Now... This is an interesting question. You totally can. It depends on what it is. And I didn't take note of what video this was on. I think it was the sweet red wine, but I could be wrong. I think it was, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, you totally can bottle directly from the fermenter. The reason we don't recommend it is you'll get the sediment in there. Now, what I like to do, even if I'm planning to bottle it almost directly, like I'm not going to let it sit in a secondary, I will rack it to a secondary container, getting it off that off the lease, off the sediment, and then bottle from there. That makes it a lot less trouble. You're less likely to have sediment and some of it can settle out while that's happening. So that's a safer way to go. But honestly, the best way is make your primary fermentation. When it's done, like I said, use the gravity readings. When it's done, rack it to a secondary fermenter, which I hate calling it secondary, but that's the industry standard. We're really just letting it settle and clarify and age a bit, okay? Keep that under airlock. Let that go four weeks, two months, however long you really want. I mean, give it at least a month, I would say, if you're gonna age it, give it a month. Then rack that to another container, then bottle immediately into the next thing. Or you can rack it and let that sit for a while too. Just you're reducing your volume every time you do, so be careful. You've probably heard us in many of our videos talk about the two rack rule. And the reason why we've instituted institutionalized sure instituted instituted the two rack rule is so that we have a clearer beverage at the end there's yep. plenty of bottles behind us that have a thick layer of sediment and that's mm -hmm. because we didn't do the two rack some and of them we didn't even age right and bottles. that's just 
And all that is on the bottom is the stuff that was suspended mm -hmm. in the liquid settled to the bottom. So giving it more time and racking it multiple times will help reduce the sediment layer that's in your final bottles. Uh, Jared Horn. I think I'm going to add some sugar between primary and secondary. Of course, I'll have to measure SG before and after to account for this in my calculations. This way, I don't have to worry whether it'll continue fermenting or not because I know it will continue fermenting and can continue on the process as usual. Now, this one concerns me because what I'm seeing here is he's, he's probably getting information from a lot of different sources and some of it's confused. From primary to secondary, there's no reason to add sugar. Now, he's talking about back sweetening but back sweetening is when it's not going to re-ferment. So by knowing that you're adding, you're really just still in primary fermentation. So I'm not completely sure what he's trying to accomplish there. And when we and go it, over the racking process and why you rack and the difference between primary and secondary fermentation, this will make more sense as to mm -hmm. why that's not necessarily a good, good idea. Right. If his intent is to, to do a step feed to increase his ABV, if his lease is still active, then he wants to keep that all in primary because he doesn't want to rack it because that's going to limit his colony for the step feeding process. Hopefully that made sense. If not, we're going to do a thing on step feeding separately yeah. in a different video. Hayden, aloha. Sounds like somebody's from Hawaii. Aloha. aloha, dig the vids. Maybe you can help me. Started a batch of three gallons mead using bread yeast. Very active first four days. Five days into it and I added Lalvin 45. 2.5 grams, active, looking good. After only 10 days, I racked into new clean carboy only because sediment on bottom and floaters on top were looking a little sketchy. Now a new carboy, very little bubble action, one bubble every 30 seconds. As of now, batch is two weeks old. My question is, can I add a bit more yeast or should I hold off being two weeks into fermentation? Cheers. Okay, this question comes up so often. Uh, we hear this all the time. Hey, I made a mead, I racked it after four days, and now it stopped. What do I do? Okay, let me explain what you did first. By racking it so soon, you removed most of the colony of yeast because it's suspended in the liquid, but it's also in the bottom. That stuff is still active. That's why a lot of people will siphon off their brew and then pour new juice or whatever right on that yeast cake because it's still active yeast. By removing that, you forced it to have to build a new colony all over again to start fermentation. You could have strained it. You could have so few in solution that it couldn't build a new colony. Or, more likely, there's no oxygen there. They can't build a new colony anymore. So you literally sort of stuttered it. It just, you, you, you stopped it. One thing but that I want to talk about right now is observing a brew and determining whether it's good or bad. Stuff hmm. on the bottom... There should be stuff on the yeah. bottom. If there's not stuff on the bottom, then, then something probably happened wrong. Yeah. So the stuff on the bottom, that's normal. That's expected. That should be there. Stuff on the top sometimes is an issue, but not normally. There if it's is, off color. There is a thing that creates at the top that's called the Croissant line. And this is when the yeasts come to the top because they when they're really active, they, it kind of looks like a lava lamp, the whole thing. And some of them will stick on the top and then dry and make right. a little crunchies around Because yeah, in the beginning, the it's very active and it bubbles up. That is completely yeah. normal. Totally that's normal expected. And totally fine. Yep. Um, if you see little clumps floating on the top like islands and they start to get fuzzy that could be bad that could be bad if they turn colors too like greens and blues yeah generally not good that's not good very but... weird smells like bad smells like something that you would go you like wretch when you smell it just dump it don't even try it's very 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 rare and honestly if you get something like that Send us a picture somehow through Facebook or whatever and let us try to help you. Yeah. Because I hate to see somebody just dump a brew. We've heard so many times, and we're not going over this, so we're going to be brief about it, but we've heard so many times of like, oh, this this happened, so I just dumped it. Yeah, and we're don't like, dump it. no, why did you do that? Especially yeah, with meads, because honey and the grand scheme of all the ingredients you can make a brew from, honey is one of the more expensive ones. So we're yeah. really super sad when people dump their mead. And it's kind of hard to really infect it that badly that it's It probably dangerous. didn't need to be dumped. So racking, what is racking? Let's start there. Racking is the act of removing your liquid from moving your liquid from one vessel to another. Normally, it is to remove solids or sediment and things like that. 
If you do it too soon, as we said, you're leaving the colony behind and you could stifle, that's the word, stifle the brew and it just gets stuck. Meaning now you have a brew that's kind of in limbo. It might not have finished, but if you bottle it, what if it starts back up? It could be dangerous. So it's kind of a bad thing to do too early. You don't rack until it's totally done. Secondary fermentation is wrongly named. It really should be called clarifying and aging. So if you feel like you have a stalled brew, do not rack. Yeah, don't rack Because it. that's going to make it worse. Make it worse, exactly. If you feel like you are done because bubbles have stopped, don't rack. Take a reading. Do the, yeah. the one week wait for the reading. Bubbles counts. are not something you should pay attention to yeah. because you can literally take a jug of water, put an airlock on it, and temperature changes in your house will make it bubble. It's not a good indicator of fermentation at all. It just means that there's a pressure change in the bottle. That's it. If you want to stop your fermentation, racking is part of the process, but it's not the complete end all of the process. If you want to stop your fermentation, the first thing I want to say to you is why? Why? The only reason, and I mean the only reason to stop fermentation is to create a sweet, sparkling, low alcohol beverage. Other than that, ask yourself, why am I stopping fermentation? If it's simply because you like the sweetness level that it's at now and you don't want it to ferment further, well, I'm sorry. That means you probably should have used a different yeast or a different recipe. It's not a good idea to try to stop fermentation and it's actually very difficult to do. There are two chemicals that people tend to use to do this. When one of them is potassium metabisulfite and the other one is potassium sorbate. Now they don't actually kill yeast as a lot of people like to think. Potassium metabisulfite actually stops the colony from being able to reproduce and potassium sorbate stops it or helps to stop it from consuming, uh, consuming sugar and turning it into alcohol. The two combined give an effect that is like it killed the yeast and stops it. For all intents and purposes, it sort of does for a time. Both of those things can actually age out and or be boiled out, be heated out, be oxygenated out. There's many, many ways that those things can fail and you can still have fermentation start up. The only way to actually kill yeast is heat, pasteurization. Yeast dies at around 120 degrees, maybe a little bit higher in some cases. So we recommend 135 to 140 degrees for about 20 minutes at the temperature inside the bottle. That will actually kill it. However, it's dangerous and it's risky. You can lose bottles and, and bad it's also happen. tricky because if you get it too high beside the explosion uh, risk, you could, lose, you your could lose your alcohol. So, so I mean, that's a whole other video, but I just wanted to go over it. Basically, there's no reason unless you have a really good reason. Like I almost never do. We let fermentation go till it's done. And even then some, we let it go, and, let it go. Time we, is your friend. We prefer brews on the sweet end of the spectrum. Yep. So we take all this into account before we even make the brew. We choose our yeast, knowing what its um, sugar tolerance or what is, I'm sorry, what its alcohol. alcohol tolerance is. And we choose the amount of sugars we put in it to make sure we have enough sugars to keep it sweet, but not too many sugars. That's right. what's gonna stall our fermentation. And what you can also do is, you know, plant for it to go just a little bit dry, just below, and then you can step feed it until it gets to exactly where you want it. There's a lot of different ways to manage it, and they're all safe. Uh, the idea that you have to stabilize your brews is completely, no, it's it's not true. It, and I just showed, it's not even as safe as people make it out to be. A lot of people think, oh, I just added stabilizer, it's fine. Not necessarily. <laughs> so it's much better to use the science of it all and use the biological processes of the yeast naturally. That way they're done, they finish out, nothing's gonna come of it. If there's no, no sugars for them to consume or they're past the point where they're completely full, they go dormant and that's the end. They don't, they don't reactivate. So if you have more questions on racking, please put them in the description below. We'll, to we'll answer them. Brian answers all the questions on our videos. He does a great job. Yay, Probably 75%, I'll be honest. <laughs> I, I try to. And we work really hard to be as transparent as we can in mm -hmm. our comment section so that way everybody can learn. As always, guys, thanks for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye.